Turn with me, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 2, the second chapter of Exodus. In Hebrew, we call the original name of the book of Exodus is Shemot. Shemot. These are the names. Shemot. In verse 11 of chapter 2 of Exodus, Shemot Perek Bet Psuk Echadisrei. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that and when he saw there was no one around he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the next day and behold two Hebrews were fighting with each other and he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and filled the troughs to the water <coughs> the father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Raul, which has the idea of looking at God, their father, he said, why have you come back so soon today? Now, Raul is also Jethro, the same person with two names, Yitro, Jethro. Jethro is revered as the prophet of the Druzy faith in Israel. So they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now, Sephora comes from the Hebrew word bird, from bird, and Gershom has to do with a sojourner or a foreigner, an alien. In fact, the Hebrew word for a convert to Judaism is a ger, the same root. Now, it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel and took notice of them. Then now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord... In Hebrew, the definite article, Hamal Akadonai, the angel of the Lord, appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush, and looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw, Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. <coughs> now the term in Hebrew is hineni. It doesn't mean here I am. It means here I am. What do you want me to do? Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry of their taskmaster, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. 
Therefore, come now and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you when I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And again, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And it is usually believed that the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Yehovah, is he who was, he who is, he who is to come. I am who I am. And in Simcha Torah and John chapter 8, they picked up stones to stone Jesus because he said before Abraham was, in Greek, ego ami, I am, Jesus identifying himself as God. So we have this famous story of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, and the burning bush. The first thing we have to understand is that Moses typifies Christ. Deuteronomy 18, chapter 18, verse 18, the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. Remember, it's trying to show this. A wicked king was determined to destroy all the Jewish children. Moses was protected through the faith of his parents in Egypt for a season. Then he comes out of Egypt and goes to the Promised Land. So Jesus faced the same prospect. A wicked king was going to destroy all the Jewish male children. And Jesus was protected in Egypt for a season through the faith of his parents. And then he comes out of Egypt and returns to the Promised Land. It's showing Moses as a type of Christ. But in Hebrew, you have a word play, Moshe, to draw out. And he lives up to his name. He was drawn out of water. And so you see the same word in the Hebrew text, he drew out the water for us. He drew out the water for us. It's always that his name is being played out in the text of Exodus. These things don't come across well, or they don't come across at all, virtually, in the translations. Now remember, just like Jesus, the first time he comes to save his Jewish brothers, they reject him. They accept him the second time when their anguish and their suffering has become excruciating and they're desperate. And so it is with the Jews. The Jews don't accept Jesus the first coming. They accept him at the second coming. Only they looked upon Moses as an Egyptian, the same as they would look upon Joseph as an Egyptian. Remember, Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him at the first coming either. They recognized him at the second and wept bitterly. And so it is with the Jews. They look upon Moses, not the first time, but the second. The way they saw him was as an Egyptian. Well, Jews think Jesus is a Gentile. <laughs> they think he's a look upon him as a Gentile. Moses, he's an Egyptian. That's how people see him. You know, the Jesus, they look, give him a blonde hair and blue eyes. This is totally absurd. It's totally alien to what the Bible teaches, but that's the way Jewish people think. They thought Moses was an Egyptian. They thought that Joseph was an Egyptian. You know, a Gentile. Well, the Jews think Jesus is virtually a Gentile. Now, this is not true. They, they objectively know he's a Jew, but subjectively they relate to him as a Gentile. Just, just his conditioning was to look upon him as a non-Jew. Well, it's the same with Moses. Same with Joseph. He looked like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. You know, the Egyptian, he was an Egyptian prince. He's an Egyptian. He's not one of us. It's showing Moses here as a type of Christ. But also, what we see with Moses is what you see with Jesus. He tries to save his own people and they reject him. The Gentiles accept him, remember? When he tries to stand up for his own people, they reject him. So he goes to Midian and the Midianites, when he stands up for them, they accept him. <laughs> then his own people turn to him. And so it is with Jesus. At first they reject him. The Gentiles, they accept him. And then his own people turn to him. It's showing Moses as a picture of the Messiah. Now we have a tape about this called Jesus, a prophet like Moses. That's not our purpose today. Our purpose is the burning bush, but I have to do justice to the text. Another feature is the angel of the Lord with the definite article. Not an angel, but the angel. 
as we talk about on the Val of the Nazarite tape, and as we talk about on the Judges 1 and 2 tape, the angel of the Lord, with the definite article, Hamel Akadonai, is a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of the Messiah. It's not an angel because this is God himself. The text says God spoke to Moses from the bush, but the angel spoke to God from the bush. Or the angel spoke as God from the bush to Moses. In Judaism, the angel of the Lord is called the Metatron, the Metatron, the one who dwells at the center of the throne. We also have a tape for witnessing to Orthodox Jews called the Metatron. Now the Metatron is here. The angel of the Lord is here. He's talking to Moses and he's identified as being God. Now the Hebrew word for angel, like the Greek word, angelos, means messenger. So the Metatron, the angel of the Lord, is God's messenger, yet he is God himself. God himself. The idea of God becoming a man is unfathomable in popular Jewish thinking. However, Jacob, uh, Jacob wrestled with the Metatron. He wrestled with Hamel Ak Adonai, the angel of the Lord. So you had an enfleshment of God. Adam heard God walking in the garden. And if, you know, the incarnation of Jesus, while important, was not in the absolute sense a, a precedent. God had, had come and incarnate before him before. He walked in the garden with Adam, but he was also the angel of the Lord. Hence, <clears throat> we see this is a Christological passage. It talks about the Messiah, God's messenger, who would come and dwell with his people. Even the idea of the bush not being destroyed, even though it burned. Remember in Isaiah, Jesus was incorruptible. He will not suffer his Holy One's flesh to see decay. His corpse did not rot in the earth. Okay. Now let's look. Moses is a good picture of anybody who really wants to serve God. In fact, he's one of the best pictures. The first thing we see about Moses is this. Moses as a prince of Egypt, grandson of Pharaoh, was educated in the wisdom of Egypt before he was educated in the wisdom of God. He had the best education the world could have had. But when he encountered the God of his fathers, he realized what Egypt had amounted to nothing. <laughs> Somebody can be totally uneducated and once they meet the true and living God, among other repercussions, they'll become smarter. Something else that happens, a smart person, an educated person who meets God will realize how dumb he is. An uneducated person will begin to get clever. Moses was trained in the wisdom of Pharaoh before he was trained in the wisdom of God. Now the Egyptians deified Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a divine being to them. Egypt in the Bible, we know from 1 Corinthians, is a metaphor for the world. And of course these things typify Antichrist. Whenever you see a man worshipped as God, other than Jesus himself, it typifies the Antichrist who's coming. Moses was deified and worshipped as God. I'm not, I'm sorry, Pharaoh was. And Moses could have been in that family. But we're told in Hebrews that he chose the reproach of Christ instead of the pleasures of this world. He was a prince of Egypt. He had the best Egypt had to offer in terms of position, power, and education. But he chose the reproach of Christ. Moses already knew about the Messiah. Okay? And it was the angel of the Lord he would meet. So, he comes and he tries to help one of his own people. And his own people reject him. And he has to flee away for his life. Where does he flee to? He flees to the wilderness. He winds up where the law would again be given, Mount Horeb. 
The book of Galatians tells us this was in Arabia. The present Mount Sinai in the Sinai is not Mount Sinai of the Bible. It's St. Catherine's. That's not the real Mount where the Ten Commandments was given, where the law was, that's not where it happened. The real one was in, certainly in northwest Saudi Arabia. Says, Paul says that it's in uh, Arabia, okay, in, in Galatians 4. And that's where it is. The Midianites were the native inhabitants who may have intermarried with black people. We don't know if Zipporah was the wife of Moses who was black or if that was a second or later wife, but one of Moses' wives was a black woman. Okay. So here we have Moses. In figure like Christ, he takes a Gentile bride, the church. Okay. He comes to save his own people and he's rejected. He goes into the wilderness and he's accepted by the Gentiles, by the non-Jews who think he's an Egyptian. Well, it's an amazing thing that not only did Jews look upon Jesus as a non-Jew, but even a lot of so-called Christians look upon Jesus as a non-Jew. <laughs> I was just talking to Liz, and there was, there's, there's some very vehemently anti-Semitic Ruckmanites, King James-only people, who are vehemently anti-Semitic in Australia. They call themselves the two Wendy's, and they're, they're, they're notoriously anti-Israel, but they're essentially anti-Semitic. They're, they're, anti, they're, vicious, they're, they're vicious liars, but they're, among other things, vehemently anti-Semitic. They say they're Christians. They say they, they lie, they're, they're racist, but they say they're... They, well, to them, Jesus is a non-Jew. <laughs> He's an Egyptian. <laughs> Jews see him as a non-Jew. Anti-Semitic Christians see him as a non-Jew. The Bible says he is a Jew. He never forgets his own people. Moses never forgot his own people. He tried to help them, and they rejected him. But he still never forgot that they were his people. And so it is. He winds up going into the wilderness, rejected. This pattern of being forced into the wilderness as a result of rejection is a recurrent characteristic of those whom God calls. We think of King David. The prophet Samuel anoints him. And instead of him assuming the throne, he has to leave town in a hurry to the cave of Adullam and then out into the wilderness. But he's just been anointed. He's God's chosen one. And he has to get out of town, and he has to get out of town quick, real quick, <laughs> into the wilderness of Zin. The wilderness of Zin. We think of Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of the Pharisees from the rabbinic school of Hillel, disciple of Rabbi Gamaliel, the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Well, if Moses had the finest education Egypt had to offer, Paul was educated in the best yeshiva. Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, there he is, now this guy with all this highfalutin rabbinic education, and he knows Greek philosophy, he knows Hebrew, he knows Aramaic, he knows Latin, he's a Roman citizen, he's holding all the cards. What a wonderfully educated man, used to be an enemy of the gospel, used to ride with the hunters, now he runs with the foxes. Isn't God going to use him? No, he winds up going into the wilderness, rejected. The wilderness. He spends years in the wilderness. David spends years in the wilderness. Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness. 40 in the Bible is the number of testing. As Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Jonah gave Nineveh 40 days to repent. It rained 40 days and 40 nights when Noah was in the ark. And the children of Israel sojourned 40 years in the wilderness. It's always 40. God just chose you, Moses! Rejection, wilderness. God chose you, Paul! From the day he gets saved, knocked off the horse. You're going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Oh yeah, 
Rejection, wilderness. King David, Samuel has anointed you. You're going to be king. Rejection, wilderness. You want God to use you? First thing that will happen is rejection. And the second thing will happen is the wilderness. I had a naive idea. I said, Lord, I'm educated in science. And Lord, I make a few thousand a week. That was 25 years ago. And Lord, now I'm going to give it all to you. Big deal. I wind up in Israel thinking I'm going to be an evangelist to the Jews in Israel in the last days. I had a miserable, rotten job filling prescriptions because it was the only thing I knew how to do. I thought when I got saved, my days of selling drugs was over. <laughs> Trying to explain to old ladies in Yiddish how many to take because they didn't know Hebrew. I didn't either at the time, not well. I'm out in the middle of nowhere. So I looked out the window. And there was sand. Why was there sand? Because I was in the desert. <laughs> Literally. There was better ones with camels. I left New York to live in a wilderness? I gave up a high-paid position for this? This is what you bought me here for? The wilderness? This? I thought you brought me here to use me. Oh no, that comes later. I didn't bring you here to use you in Israel. I brought you to Israel to use Israel in you. <laughs> Rejection. I discovered that much like the Jews in New York, a lot of the Jews in Israel didn't want to hear about Jesus either. Only in New York, sometimes they would throw rocks. In Israel, some of them weren't beyond throwing hand grenades, at least the yeshiva boys. We got stoned on the promenade in Haifa, to actually chased by mobs with rocks. I mean, when I used to give out tracts with Jews for Jesus in, in, in New York, and that the old ladies used to spit on me and stuff like that. Well, if you're such a good Jew, why are you out shopping on the Sabbath? <laughs> it was on a Saturday. They didn't like that. <laughs> you're handling filthy lucre on Shabbos. But they would just spit at you. Or sometimes the JDL Jewish defense would come and push you and beat you up or something like that. But it was mob violence. So here I am in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what was going on. I was... Annika Butz trying to improve my Hebrew. Which I eventually did. But on this kibbutz I began teaching Bible studies to small groups of people. Israelis. There were evangelistic Bible studies. A lot of people didn't get saved. What did you bring me here for? I used to be able to write checks and give money away to missions and evangelism. Now I'm broke all the time. I was a prince of Egypt. Now I'm nothing. 
I thought you said you were going to use me. No. Nope. Rejection. Wilderness. Moses didn't know why this happened to him. All right, you're the God of my fathers, and I tried to stand up for my people, and I tried to do what was right, and I tried to use my position, my power, my education for you, Lord, and I just wound up rejected and exiled to the desert. Something was happening in that wilderness that he didn't understand at the time. How was he able to lead the children of Israel 40 years through that same wilderness? He was able to lead the children of Israel, a nation of 1.5 million adults, plus Egyptian stragglers, plus children, through that wilderness for 40 years because he had spent 40 years in it himself. Wilderness is a place of death. Scorpions, cobras, vultures swarm overhead. No water, unless you find an oasis. One here, one there. How do you survive in the wilderness? Well, that's what you've got to learn, Moses. After I taught you how to survive in the wilderness, then I can use you to lead a whole nation through the wilderness. You see, we've come out of the domain of Pharaoh when we got saved. We've come out of Egypt. But we have yet to enter the promised land that flows with milk and honey. We've come out of the world, but as 1 Corinthians 10 says, we haven't entered heaven. We are sojourning in the wilderness. We have a tape, sojourning in the wilderness on Exodus 15. The way and the reason Moses was able to do it was he spent so many years in that wilderness. What does God say? Let the leaders be tested. How did you stand in the wilderness? Now he had this education, but it didn't do him any good. You see, there are things that no university, no seminary, no Bible college can ever teach you. The finest theological institutions in the world can teach you about the Bible. But it's only in the wilderness where you can be taught what the Bible is about. To know about the Bible is good. An academic knowledge of Scripture is helpful. It is practical. I am not demeaning learning Greek and Hebrew and literary criticism and biblical history and archaeology. It is good to know about the Bible. But it's not good enough. It is important. But it is not what is most important. Learning about the Bible is necessary. But what comes first is learning what the Bible is about. That no man can teach you. That is something only God can teach you. That is something no institution can provide an environment to learn. It is something only the wilderness provides an environment to learn. How can you lead people through wilderness? Let the leaders be tested. How did this person handle disappointment, crisis in health, marital struggles, problems in ministry, financial setback? How does this person handle those things? Once this person has handled those things in the strength and wisdom of the Lord, then and only then is that person equipped to be God's vehicle to encourage others 
through that same wilderness. No, you will never learn that in a Bible college, in a seminary, or a university faculty of divinity. That you will only learn in the wilderness. Then comes the other. Only then does God say, now go to Pharaoh. You grew up in his court. You were educated in his academies. You speak his language. You know his culture, his philosophy, his worldview. You have the best education Pharaoh could have given you. Now go to Pharaoh. Only once you've been through the wilderness will an academic education be of any practical value. <laughs> I've seen people with the silly notion that they're going to go to university, then they're going to go into the ministry, or they're going to go to Bible college, then they're going to go to the ministry. Well, I'll go to Wycliffe Hall or to LBC or whatever it is. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't even work that way in secular professions. You get a, a, a defense contractor in the States, like Boeing or McDonnell Douglas. They'll try to recruit people with master's degrees or doctorate degrees from the best engineering schools. They'll, they'll go to Imperial College in London, or they'll go to MIT or something like that. They'll get the best people. And then they'll say, now we're going to train you to be an engineer. But I graduated MIT. No, you work for us five years from now. It'll be five years from now before we get any real use out of you. You graduate with a degree in medicine. In the States, you become an intern, then a resident. In Britain, you become an assistant registrar, then a registrar. But I've already been to medical college. No, 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 no. You finish law school, good. Now you've got to do your articles, and you have to go clerk. Do paralegal work. Then you become an assistant solicitor. Then you become a junior solicitor. Five years from now, you can call yourself a lawyer, but I have a degree. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in engineering. It doesn't work that way in medicine. It doesn't work that way in law. Much less does it work that way in ministry. Only after you've been through the wilderness will the education do you any good. Now go to Pharaoh. Now you're qualified. Moses was a shepherd. The Hebrew word for shepherd, ro'e, is the same word for pastor. Ro'e has inherent in it the idea of seeing. Adonai ro'e, the Lord is my shepherd, but <clears throat> it's almost similar, it, it sounds similar, and there's a, there's a word play and a slight spelling change to the word to see. This guy sees where he's going. <laughs> in the wilderness, you can become very disoriented in the desert. Very disoriented. Everything looks the same. Because of dehydration sickness, you become prone to see things like mirages. You don't know where you're going. You can see which way the sun rises and the sun sets, and it'll give you something of a bearing. But the best way to navigate through the wilderness is at night. <laughs> the best way to navigate is at night. Because at least you have this, the Bedouins use the stars. It's quite a skill to learn how to survive in the wilderness. But to see a whole nation survive in the wilderness? Never despise the day of small things. When God calls you, and every one of us has a ministry. Not all the same ministry, but everybody has a ministry. The thing to expect first is rejection. Rejection. Why? Because we can only be the Lord's ministers in the character of Christ. And the first thing Christ experienced was rejection. Who has believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look upon him. <laughs> we esteemed him not. That's what Isaiah said about the Messiah, Isaiah 53. Rejection, before God can use you, you have to experience rejection. 
Second thing, the desert, the wilderness. So often, people who God called were shepherds. Amos, perhaps most famously King David, but of course Moses, a shepherd at Midian. Okay. Can you take care of a few sheep? You can take care of a flock. Take care of a flock, you can take care of a nation. Never despise the day of small things. God was doing things in that wilderness that Moses had no way of comprehending or appreciating at the time. He accepted it by faith. When you're in the wilderness, all you know is that you're in the wilderness and you've been rejected. You know you've had rejection and that you're out in the desert. That's all you know. The rest you have to take by faith. It was only later when the whole nation was following him and he was experiencing challenge after challenge that he had the wherewithal because God, as I always say, prepares people for the extraordinary and the ordinary. Only after you're no longer in the wilderness, only in retrospect do you see what God was doing in that wilderness. There was an Israeli-born evangelist, close friend of mine, loved the guy, and he divorced and remarried unbiblically, and we had to stop our support for him. He'd been Israel's premier Israeli, Jewish, Hebrew-speaking evangelist for years, and I begged him not to enter this adulterous marriage, but he did, and we had to stop our support of him. But... Fortunately, there is somebody in Israel, an Israeli Jew, born in this country, who is even more radical than he is. Somebody who will stand up in front of gangs of Orthodox Jews and proclaim Yeshua. Somebody, when Muslims pulled guns on him, we're going to shoot him dead. He just kept saying, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Somebody who was evangelistically fearless. Not careless, but fearless. I was very frustrated when I was in that desert. But on Christmas Day, 1982, I had a young Israeli Jew from Manchester, England, who hated Christians, pray with me to receive Yeshua. I didn't have much fruit then. But that Israeli Jew today is Israel's leading evangelist. I've only led a few to Christ. Quality is more important than quantity. Get those few. See those grow up in the way of the Lord. Let them be radical for the gospel. Then how many will they reach? At the time, I couldn't see this. At the time, I'm in the wilderness. Now I can look back 20 years later and see what God was doing. I didn't see it at the time. First thing is rejection. Second thing is the wilderness. And it goes on and on and on. He is there for an awful long time out in the middle of the wilderness. But something else was happening. When Moses was in the wilderness, he didn't know that his own people who rejected him were going to be brought to a place of desperation where they would accept him. His mission field wasn't ready yet. His mission field wasn't ready yet. It's years later. At one time, the most aggressive evangelist was a gypsy. They called him Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith led many people to Christ. 
in his day. He was probably the most radical evangelist on the face of the earth at that time, as far as I know. He led many people to Christ. There was only one problem with Gypsy Smith. Almost none of the people that Gypsy Smith led to Christ were gypsies. <laughs> that came later. Much later. The move of God began among the gypsies. <laughs> Much later. Well, David, you're going to be king. Saul's pursuing you. He's going to kill you. Rejection. The outcasts of Israel joined themselves to David. The outcasts, everyone who was in debt, every loser, every nobody. But as we continue to read, we read later on about David's mighty men, the commanders of his army, the generals of the Israeli armed forces. Who were these generals in the Israeli armed forces? Who were the commanders of the army of the Lord? They're not called the armies of David. They're called the armies of the Lord. Who are these Israeli generals? Who are the commanders of the army of the Lord? Who are David's mighty men? The same losers. The same outcasts. The same down and out people who joined him at the cave of Adullam. Where does God take a loser, a nothing, a nobody, and make him a general? Sandhurst? They didn't have any Sandhurst. West Point? They didn't have any West Point. No, God took these losers and made them into David's mighty men. God took these nobodies and made them into the commanders of the armies of the Lord in the wilderness. First they learned how to outfox Saul. Then they learned how to outfox the Philistines. Then they conquered the Philistines. Where'd they learn it? David taught them. David's a type of Christ, isn't he? Son of David. Ben David Yeshua. The Lord himself, the son of David, will teach you things in the wilderness you're never going to learn anywhere else. How to outsmart the enemy. But it wasn't pleasant out there. Just think of Moses. I was a prince of Egypt. I have all this money, power, position, privilege. I'm an educated man. And now I'm out in the wilderness. God, you said you called me. I was drawn out of the water for this. Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. I'm going to be an apostle to the Gentiles and have to sneak out of town in a basket out the wall. Something happened to Paul, though, in Arabia. Paul was actually able to write about the Last Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 in a way that's almost mysterious. He said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. He wasn't at the Last Supper. How did he receive it from the Lord if he wasn't there? Where did he get it? He got it out in the wilderness. He got it out in the desert. It may have been in the desert where he was raptured in 2 Corinthians, whether in body or in spirit, he didn't know. But he saw things that he couldn't tell you about because they were too unspeakable, too amazing, too incredible. So it is with Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. So it is with King David so it is with Moses. So it is with anybody who really wants to serve the Lord. Rejection, then the wilderness. But after a long time, almost out of the blue, something happens to Moses in that wilderness. At some point, David came in from the cold. He returned from the wilderness of Zin. At some point, Paul came back from Arabia. 
At some point, God is going to call you back in from the wilderness. After he's taught you everything he needs to teach you in the wilderness, because in this fallen world, there is no other place and no other way to learn it. And those things are essential. But let's look at Moses. God speaks to him from a burning bush. Now the people are ready. You see, the gypsies were not ready for the message of Gypsy Smith. Israel was not ready for the message of Moses. Now they're ready. When God has you in the wilderness, not only preparing you for your mission, he's preparing your mission for you. <laughs> Things are going to be tough on you in the wilderness, but it's going to be tough on them. Now we begin to understand what God was really doing. And out of nowhere, God speaks to him from a burning bush. And he says, here's the sign. When you lead these people out, you're going to come right to the same mountain. This is where I will give you the covenant, the law, the Torah. In other words, in the ministry, you can never ever lead somebody to some place where you haven't already been yourself. You can never, ever, ever bring somebody somewhere you haven't been. After you've been there. After you know what it's like to encounter the living God. <coughs> then, he can use you to bring somebody else there. But unless you've been there yourself, you're not bringing anybody else. So what happens next in the wilderness? He wants to see the marvelous sight. Why is the bush not burned up? Now notice something. At this point in his life, Moses is 80 years old. One of the lies of the world is this. Retirement. The only thing retirement means for a Christian, if their health permits, is now you are able to serve God full-time instead of part-time. The only thing retirement means for a Christian is now you are able to serve God full-time instead of part-time. Until such time as age and health no longer permit you to continue like when David finally had to step down and hand it over to Solomon. The crown is at the end. The world says your prime is when you're middle-aged. No, God says your prime is when you are old-aged. It's just the opposite of what the world says. Somehow the church has allowed the world to put its perverse model on us. God, however, doesn't see it that way. God sees all the other stuff as preparation for old age. <laughs> he doesn't see it the way the world does. Unfortunately, the church listens to the mentality of the world more than it does the mentality of the Lord. God just doesn't see it that way. You just look at it. Your secular career and business is over now. That's it. You no longer have to hustle to make a living and put the kids through university. That's done. Lust, forget about it. The testosterone and estrogen levels have depleted. Hang it up, granny, it's over. <laughs> what are you going to do with a young chick anyway? You're an old man. The lusts of the flesh are not going to wax as heavily against you. 
You've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. What's next? It's different. The world says youth, middle age. God says no. Youth, middle age. That's preparation for old age. The Hebrew word for elder means somebody who's older. Older. Do not allow the world's idea to come into your thinking as a Christian. The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation when he was in his 90s. An incredible age for that time in history. So you wonder, when's it going to happen for me? I'm already 50, I'm already 60, I'm already... Well, you're getting closer. <laughs> and God called to Moses, Moshe, Moshe, and he said, Hineni. Not just here I am, but I'm ready. What do you want me to do? We'll see what God tells him. I'm going to send you to deliver my people from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land that's good, spacious land flowing with milk and honey. Now look what Moses says. Who am I to go to Pharaoh? Then it's, I stammer. How am I going to talk to Pharaoh? I stutter. A speech defect? You want me to give your law to a nation? I can't even speak. I have a speech defect. You want me to talk to Pharaoh? Can't you hear my stammering? I mean, I know you got it, everything. But if you want a sp sp spokesman, you be 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 better find s s somebody else. Now, that's not to mock people who stutter. It's to mock the mentality that makes people think because of a handicap, God can't use them. <laughs> somebody with a speech defect or a speech impediment doesn't deserve to be mocked. But the mentality that lets that hold you back deserves to be mocked because God just doesn't see it that way. The point is this. When he goes into the wilderness, I'm a prince. When he goes into the wilderness, I'm wealthy. When he goes into the wilderness, I have position. When he goes into the wilderness, I have power. When he goes into the wilderness, I'm educated. He knows all about his strengths when he goes into the wilderness. The man or the woman who God brings into the wilderness will be entirely different than the man or the woman who God brings out. The one who goes in knows their strengths. The one who comes out knows their weakness. Then they know God's strength. His strength is always magnified in our weakness. The man or woman who God brings into the wilderness is one person. The man or the woman who God brings out, although it's the same person, are completely different in character, in perspective, in demeanor. When he goes in, he knows all about his abilities. When he goes in, he's confident. When he comes out, he has no confidence in himself. Then God can use his background. Once we learn not to trust our education, our cleverness, our background, our position, once we learn not to trust those things, once we learn our insufficiency, then God will use those things. 
our strength has to be in him. The person who goes into the wilderness knows their strength. The one who comes out only knows their weakness, that they may experience God's strength. That's the main point. Not only that, how am I going to speak to Pharaoh? Bring your brother Aaron with you. With that wimp? Yeah. You see, the person who went into the wilderness couldn't inspire anybody. His own people turned on him. The person who came out of the wilderness could inspire others. The person who went into the wilderness couldn't inspire anybody. His own people turned on him. But the one who came out could inspire others. Where did he learn how to do that? He learned to do it the same place you're going to learn to do it. He learned to do it in the wilderness because there's no place else to learn. I wish I could teach people this. But I can't teach people this. The reason I can't teach people this is because nobody could teach it to me. The only one who could teach this to us is God himself. I wish I could open a theological institute, a seminary, a Bible college, an academy of some description and teach this to people. But there's no institution, no matter how renowned, going to be able to teach this to people. It's something you can only learn in the wilderness. The man or the woman who God brings in is one person. The man or the woman who God brings out is another. When God speaks through the burning bush, one day he speaks and the whole thing lights up. Then you begin to understand what God was doing. Then you understand why he took so much away. The reason he took so much away is because he wants to give more. You don't lose it. You get it back when the time is right. Just look at it. I'm a prince of Egypt. I'll handle this. Forty years later, how am I going to go to Pharaoh? I can't handle this. Oh, yes, you can. You're a prince of Egypt. <laughs> you know how to talk to him. You were educated at his universities. You went to Oxbridge, Ivy League, or Sorbonne. You can do it. Then God will use your human background. And so it happens. The pattern gets clearer. You want God to use you? The first thing to anticipate is rejection. You will be rejected. Not by the world. Who cares what they think? You'll be rejected by your own brothers, your own sisters, your own people. That's the rejection that hurts. Rejection. Jesus was rejected by his fellow Hebrews. Moses was rejected by his fellow Hebrews. Joseph was rejected by his fellow Hebrews. Joseph, Moses, Jesus, Paul, you, me, get rejected by their own people. All that education, all that experience, all that money, power, position, prestige goes into the wilderness with you where it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Until God speaks from the burning bush. And speak he will. How can I go? Because I'm sending you. Who are you? I am who I am. You see, when Moses 
was the prince of Egypt. Moses knew who he was. What he needed to find out was who God is. You never find out who God is until you meet him in the wilderness. In the wilderness, you find out who God is. Anybody can be spiritual when things are good. Then he comes out. Something will happen to you in the wilderness. You won't know what it is. In the beginning, it'll intrigue you. Let me get a closer look at this. But then you'll quickly realize you're standing on holy ground. Holy ground where God wants to use you to bring others to. Bring them to the holy ground. Lord, that's why you brought me out here? Yeah. But they rejected me. They weren't ready. And you weren't either. Now they're ready, and so are you. But how can I do it? I can't talk to him. I can't do this. I oh, yes, you can. You could always do it. If you couldn't have done it, you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have wasted my time bringing you to the wilderness if you didn't have the capacity to do it. Then you thought you had the capacity to do it. Now you realize you only have the capacity to do it in my strength. Go do it. Go do it! From the burning bush, he hears the voice of Jesus. And he says, Hineni. There's not a one of us, not a single one of you, that God does not have a calling in your life for some ministry. I don't know what it is. It may be something to do with leadership. It may be a mission field. It may be all kinds of things. Evangelism, I don't know. But I know this. If you're really serious, if God has really called you to something, step one will be rejection. Step two will be a wilderness. Step three will be a burning bush. And I promise you, that man or that woman who comes out of that wilderness is going to be very, very different than the one who first went in. God bless. Let's have a break.